Well, I'm afraid my choice of cartoons is going to induce a lot of cynicism about uh, science. So these, you know, are, like most humor, exaggerations. The grand cycle, where you put in to get funding for your uh, research and how it's supposed to work, write grant, get money, do research, publish results, repeat. How it really works, do research, get results, but don't publish them yet, call them preliminary results, write a grant to do what you already did, get money, okay, now you can publish results, use money to pay for an unrelated new project, and then do the research. It's a system. It's an imperfect system. Okay, the last two chapters are applications. Um, various techniques to analyze proteins and DNA, although there's a lot of crossover uh, in both. And uh, we're gonna start with uh, protein analysis and something that you can do with DNA. We'll come back and talk about it with DNA as well. But uh, So, say you want to know what proteins are in a system. Or, you know what proteins are in the system, and then, but you want to get enough of them that you can analyze them. You can figure out uh, their primary structures, and possibly their other level structures. You'll see why that's iffy. For electrophoresis, you need a support medium, something you can put a mixture of proteins into that will allow it to migrate in an electromagnetic field because that's part of what's going to separate all the proteins in the mishmash away from each other. Um, there's starches that are used for this, there are papers that are used for this, and there are gels that are very typically used for this. Now the reason why you don't always get the, the ability to, to immediately get the, the upper level structures is that you want to put the proteins into a situation where they denature, where they unwind. Because you don't really want them active and interacting with one another potentially while you're trying to separate them out. And unwound works, migrates differently than wound up. Um, what you're going to do is put them at one end of the charge. Uh, ah. <laughs> Sorry, I, had to, I, I always forget what's at which, which end. Is that um, you've got your negative pole where you put your samples down and your positive pole so it electrifies the whole field. And the more negative the overall charge of the protein, the more it migrates toward the positive pole. But also because the medium itself has some permeability is that the smaller uh, proteins move faster than the larger proteins. So you're separating out proteins based on two different features, their overall charge and their size. So smaller, more negative, migrate farther. And what you do is you turn the system on for a certain amount of time. And then when you turn it off, the proteins will have separated out. And uh, sometimes even to the point, if, if you've got a really good system, um, you can separate proteins from the same gene that are produced by different alleles if it makes the proteins different enough that they migrate differently. Um, so again, you get these little little samples of proteins. Um, sometimes you can stain for them. A lot of times you just have to, uh, to sample for them. The next one has a similar 
idea where you're going to separate them out by spectroscopy with a mass spectroscope. For this, you've got to be able to take the proteins and volatilize them, is throw them into uh, a suspension in a gas, which is, turns out, for these little bitty molecules, not that difficult to do. And then they move through, again, a different charged column, but it's a gaseous charged column. And they separate out the same way. But you can separate them out with much more precision and you can read the composition of a um, sample pretty quickly. What happens is the, the proteins migrate down the column and they come out the end and you have a reader there. You can see what's going by and how much of it is going by. And uh, a spectroscopic analysis, you get these peaks. Is that, that uh, you know, reads, you know, a little bit of small, a little bit of this uh, bigger, a little bit of bigger, a little bit, is it dumb? And depending on the price and the length of the column, you can separate out lots and lots and lots of different, you know, subtle variations. When I learned how to do this, I was in a room where, um, you know, a typical spectroscope, you've got a column that's, you know, a few feet long. Maybe a meter. This column, the, the, the box was on the wall, and the column went up and all the way around the ceiling of the lab and then back down to the reader. So we were getting um, very, very subtle variations, separations of peaks of uh, the materials that are going through. Uh, originally, this was used to separate different isotopes, but it's been modified to do protein analysis. Um, Proteins can be antigens, right? They're foreign molecules in something that, uh, that they're not native to. Uh, this is done often with mice. It's sometimes done with horses where you expose them to a protein and they build up antibodies to it. You give them a chance to build up body, body, antibodies and then you collect, um, collect blood from them. And once you've got that, you've got a mixture of all the different proteins that are in the blood. You want the antibodies that were made to the particular antigen that you exposed them to. For this, um, they use a special type of cell culture where spleen cells have been fused with cancer cells. Spleen cells are good for um, antibody processing. Cancer cells are good for reproducing a lot. So it's a, a kind of an efficient culture for this. And uh, you put them on a medium that only allows the fused cells to grow. So um, you mix the cells together uh, and, and the ones that, that do fuse properly are the only ones that you wind up with in the culture. And, uh, and then you start to check for the proper antibodies made by the cells, and eventually you can wind up with uh, a clonal population of cells that are only making the antibodies that you're interested in. And then those antibodies can be used to detect the proteins you were looking for originally. Or in the case of um, uh, COVID treatments, they were treating COVID with monoclonal antibodies to the spike protein. So you take these, these antibodies and you put them in somebody that's got COVID and the antibodies flag an immune response to the viruses works relatively well. But it tends to be very precise and uh, it does not work as well against the variants as that the vaccines do okay against the variants. Um, the monoclonal antibodies do not. They're a little bit too specific. Um, this is partly why.
use the term. It's a good one of those language things, vocabulary. This is a good term to know. Um, antibodies tend to be produced. Here's a big surprise. It doesn't. An antibody. If you get a molecule that's me, and you make an antibody, there's a spot on me that antibody is going to attach to. Maybe it'll be here. Maybe it'll be here. Maybe it'll be here. That spot on the antigen that the antibody is attracted to is the epitope. Uh, more generally, it's a part of the protein's overall shape that, uh, that is critical for something that you're, you're dealing with. So it isn't necessarily purely an antibody-antibody thing. In some cancer treatments, they will produce monoclonal antibodies to um, cancer cells, and they will link the antibody molecules to chemotherapy drugs uh, or sometimes radioactive particles uh, to deliver the treatment directly to the cancer cells. That's pretty experimental right now, but uh, they call that conjuga a, a conjugated treatment. Um, and in some cases, um, there's what they call a bispecific treatment where the antibodies that they produced are particularly uh, linkable to T cells, to the response cells in the immune system. So it kind of um, amplifies the immune response to the cancer cells. Uh, in terms of, of other cancer treatments that involve uh, proteins, there are what they call interleukins and um, interferons. I'm trying to remember. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, this coronavirus that we've been dealing with is that um, your initial immune response involves uh, interferons. And one of the very first things that the viruses do when they start to get active in the cells they've invaded is shut off the interferon response so that you can't really uh, mobilize the first level of, um, of immune response. And there's uh, was some thought that if you already had interferons in play from something else, that that tamped down the ability of the of COVID to really get rolling in you. Is that I I believe based on what I've been reading that the, the fact that I had taken the uh, flu vaccine a little bit of time before I got exposed to COVID, I had a much milder response to COVID because I had interference in play. It couldn't shut down a response that was already active. And that response kept the virus a little bit under control. Um, pretty sure that spells right. There are proteins that uh, will fluoresce under various conditions. You hit them with a certain frequency of light and you get fluorescence, you get a glow. They can be tagged in various ways so that you're going, okay, you know, we know this protein is doing something in the cell. What's it doing and where's it doing it? Well, we'll tag it with fluorescence and then look in the cells to see where the cells are active. Uh, when you see these um, pictures of dividing cells and the spindles are very glowy or the chromosomes are very glowy, um, that's a fluorescence technique. In some cases, they take the gene for, um, crap, <laughs> uh, luciferin. Luciferin is one of the, there's a, a few fluorescence proteins. Luciferin was the original one. Um, and they actually append it to the gene for the protein so that wherever the cell is making that certain protein, it also automatically tags it because it makes luciferin attached to it, which hopefully doesn't shut down what it's doing. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But that's another uh, application of fluorescence that's more DNA-centered. Um, I think I'm going to stop here and pick up um, a lot of the rest of the chapter is on the process of um, pharmaceutical research. Uh, 
we'll cover that in a different 